All right, everybody, welcome to another type of webinar. This time we're talking about diabetes in school, connecting the community. Uh, I've got a lovely panel of guests that I'm going to let do most of the talking today. Um, but to start, I'm going to welcome you all. Um, I'm Christopher Snyder, Typos Community and Clinic Success Manager. Here are some fun slides to remind you about the fun things that we are doing today. Uh, as a quick reminder, Typo is a nonprofit organization. We make diabetes software that integrates data from all bunch of blood glucose meters, insulin pumps, and CGMs. But today, we're also, most importantly, um, living with or caring for someone with diabetes. And that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. Um, it, kids are going back to school, most of them in person. Um, there's a lot going on as we think about the state of the world referencing COVID-19. Um, I kind of wonder if I should even say that because I might date the podcast, but also it's a global pandemic and it's really complicated out there. So we're going to be dealing with some of this stuff for a while. But independent of the pandemic, there's also the complexities of managing diabetes in school as a um, person with diabetes yourself, if you're going to high school or college, or if you're a parent of a kid with diabetes. And that's going to be sort of where our focus is today. Um, so there are going to be some brief introductions of our panelists. There's going to be a lively discussion. And if for any of you out there that are watching live, thank you for attending. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can use that to ask questions of our panelists. And I will get to them as we go. So let's talk. Let's have a chat. Um, hello again. Uh, I'm going to change the way this webinar thing is being presented so we can focus on the person talking one at a time. And Syrah, let's start with you. Please introduce yourself to our attendees and to the people watching the archive later on. All right. Um, hi, my name is Syra. I am a development associate here at Typo, but today my role on this panel is as a parent. I actually have type one myself. Um, my husband also has type one and then both of our children have type one. And we have known Dr. Portugues since our uh, older daughter was diagnosed. And um, that was about, Dr. Portugues, how long ago was that? Like over five years ago. My um, daughter was diagnosed um, earlier this year. And we are in the midst of, this is day five of sending them both to school. So I have a lot of feelings right now. <laughs> As my dog participates in the webinar, Dr. Cortez, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Alan Cortez. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist for a number of years in, in Orange County, California. And um, I've had a long interest in uh, school uh, uh, issues uh, for over about 25 years now. And uh, I'll, I'll explain a little more of the history of, of that later as we go on. But I'm uh, glad to be here. And Stacy. Hello, I'm Stacy. I'm a credentialed school nurse, and I also live with type one. So I was diagnosed when I was in fourth grade, and it's the reason that I went to nursing school. And so now I, I work in the school environment because I always loved working with the school nurses when I was going up, going to public school. Um, and so now I love being able to work with our diabetic families in a professional capacity. So yeah, excited to be here. Awesome. I guess for the sake of completeness, I was diagnosed with type one in uh, 2002. So I can speak a little bit to, I'm not sure what I can speak to, but I'm going to try and speak to some of it every now and then. Um, let's start big picture. Syra, how long have your kids been in school this year? Like what sort of, like we're talking days, right? Yeah, this is day five uh, for my older daughter, the first grader, and then day three for my preschooler. Um, right, so our high level, how are you doing? Um, better than I was day one, better than I was two days before school. Um, it's getting a little bit better every day. So. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, let's start with Dr. Cortez. Um, when I think about the sort of relationship between uh, a person with diabetes, a caregiver of a child with diabetes, and the endocrinologist, to me, uh, I think about the three to four month sort of gap between uh, endocrinology visits. Obviously, it's not necessarily the case for everybody. Each situation is going to be different. Your diabetes can and will vary. Um, but when I think about that sort of typical gap um, between visits and interactions with your patients, um, what sort of things do you try to focus on with your patients, with those families? knowing that more often than not, you're not going to be able to have a, a more regular interaction with them, like say a school nurse. What are sort of, sort of some of the sort of high level bullet points or things you try to convey or express or make sure that are um, uh, included in whatever back to school planning um, those families are going to be going through? Right. So I think we're talking about more back to school planning in between, but uh, just uh, since it, dates don't always work out right, uh, 
one of the great things about technology and is to be able to use uh, communication to a much higher degree. And we're able to do so much of this work without anyone being in the office. So most, most people will get their school paperwork without an appointment, for example, because of the work we had set in uh, before. We just need the certain pieces of information to do so. And uh, a lot of the things you really got to work about to get that information is what is the kid uh, that we're talking about capable of doing? Some people are independent. Some people uh, think they're independent, <laughs> but their parents probably know better. And, and uh, yeah, but other, you know, other people clearly need to be supervised. Age is important, but many other issues, not only disabilities, but in, uh, just the, the, the demeanor and attitude and you know, personality of the kid. And then other people need our school nurses to do everything for them. And, and so that is probably the single most important thing to work out. Who, you know, who, who is in each of these categories? And that's something that we always delineate on, on uh, our school paperwork, because uh, that is a, a really important piece of a communication. I think another important area is, of course, how uh, to understand how decisions are made at home, because they can't always be ordered in a school environment. If someone is using the system of, I know how much insulin to give, because, and they get it right, so they might be doing a great job. I can't write an order for that, for school to follow. So we have to always figure out uh, sometimes some special differences with school paperwork uh, to, as, we, as we go on, knowing, knowing that piece of information. Uh, so that's another big thing. You know, what exactly is the current plan at home is always important. Things fortunately rarely change very much in a four month period of time. So for the very generally, uh, you know, you're saying the concern about the four months or, or three, four months, whatever it would be between appointments is all, you know, the, the, the difference for the most part is in, mo in most cases, usually a slight change in a number on the, on the orders, but, but the other 10,000 words would remain the same. Understood. Um, so as I am eventually gonna transition to Stacy, what sort of, um, it sounded like your initial response focused a lot on the paperwork. Um, is there any, I guess, to what extent is there direct coordination with those school nurses? Because I mean, you have your office, but your patients, you know, live in a variety of locations or attending different schools. So what sort of coordination do you have with those schools directly with those school nurses? And as you try and manage all those different relationships? I think it's really important to understand that each school district, they may operate very similarly, but everyone's going to be a little bit different. But generally, there are a few school nurses that will have multiple different school sites under their, their umbrella. So, they're, so for example, myself, I have one middle school and two elementary schools. And so I'm not at every single school site every day to administer insulin. So we do a lot of training as school nurses with unlicensed assistive personnel. So these are individuals like health clerks, or they might be front office staff. And those are going to be the individuals that are there at the school site every day that might be managing children's diabetes at school. So we do a lot of that training, but parents should be really aware that you know, there's not always going to be that RN that's very knowledgeable about diabetes at that school site. So we're doing the best that we can to make sure that they're, you know, aware of the symptoms of low and high blood sugar and that they're prepared to manage it. But there's a lot of, of training that goes on behind the scenes. And so with a lot of the paperwork that we receive, we can't just guess. So that's why we need the orders that are written out by, by the you know, healthcare providers, so like Dr. Cortez, that specifically list out carb ratios and how much insulin to give when the blood sugar is within a certain range, because we need to let the unlicensed people at the school site, those front office staff members, those health clerks understand how to administer the insulin. So it really, we really, you know, value having everything written out and having it very clear. So. Mm -hmm. When it comes to um, discussing these plans in that paperwork with the families, with the parents, do you find you have to do a lot of expectation management? Um, because you just said, like, you have three schools that you're responsible for. You can't be at each location simultaneously because we haven't invented that technology yet. It's probably coming soon, though. Um, mm -hmm. But how do you go about sort of navigating the complexity of that conversation saying, like, yes, I'm here. I'm going to be a resource, but I'm not going to be in that moment every single time with your child. How do you navigate that discussion? 
So yeah, usually in my cases, I try and assure the parents and the family members that I'm always available by phone, but that this is the expectation that the student, depending on their grade level and their, their developmental ability, that you know, they're aware that they need to go to the adults at the school site if they're having any type of concern. So if their blood sugar, they might feel weird, they're feeling low, like that they need to alert someone and that, you know, we trust that everyone who's been trained at the school site is able to, you know, conduct things the way that we've been training them to. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of that, that expectation management. And I think that might be hard for parents too, to, to recognize that. I mean, I'm sure Syrah can, can speak to that. Exactly. And I do want to mention as we get into some of the more specifics as Syrah is going to start to share some of her personal story that the three of these folks are all based out of Orange County, California. Is that right? So some of the things might be specific to Orange County or California. So we're going to try and call some of those things out because state to state, the stuff is obviously going to differ, but just, I'm going to put that blanket caveat out there as we get into some specifics. Um, yeah. Syrah, as you are working on, oh, Dr. Cortez, you have something? Yeah, right well, there? just to, uh, on what you said, in Orange County, just to help everyone who may not be from Orange County, has about a little over 3 million people. There are actually 26 completely independent school districts in Orange County. Okay? <laughs> they, none of them have to follow the rules of the other. There is a board of education who has been very helpful in trying to get people on the same page, but have no official capacity to do so. But they have worked very nicely to, to, to make many, many things happen over the years. Um, so, uh, and so Stacy is actually in a, in a richer school district, I think, because she only said she has three schools. Some have five to seven schools, you know. So years ago, the entire nursing system in, in uh, California was decimated for the most part at schools. And we, we, we now have a system of district nurses and people with uh, out licenses frequently at local schools. Uh, and so uh, Stacy is the is a district nurse who is then responsible for the education of all these other people. So wherever you live, you might have a school nurse uh, with the same credentials as Stacy as every single school is possible. You know, and that does change things a bit. And we don't have to worry about her needing to do two shots at the same time in two different schools. Right. You know, so these are these would be differences that we had to work out here. And the dedication of the school nurses of Orange County is incredible to make this happen on a daily basis. I mean, shout out to nurses everywhere. Let's just take a moment right there and give some respect, put some respect on those credentials that they've earned. Um, Syra, as you have gone into planning, again, we are a, a week, less than a week into um, your kids being at school. As you went into that planning process, what were um, some of the things you were hoping to um, I guess, what was your done criteria for the, the initial plan for your kids? And if you want to separate them out because of their age, um, you can go ahead and do that. But what was that initial planning phase like for you? Um, so the first uh, phase, I think I started January of 2020 is when I had asked Dr. Cortez, like, hey, let's get our, our orders in for kindergarten last year. And um, oddly enough, I mean, because of COVID, she didn't actually start in person for until way later. So um, our experience is going to be a little bit different because of that, but that was when I started the process with the orders. And I remember before we knew COVID was a thing, um, I had this whole chart, um, with like our arrows and all the numbers and Dr. Cortez was like, this is great. This is what you do at home. This is a lot for teachers or like anybody. Um, and I was really upset about it at first. I was like, but this is what I do. And I don't really care about all the other kids. Like I care about my kid being safe. Um, and I have a friend who's also a patient of Dr. Cortez and, their, and her son had gone to TK. And I remember asking her, like, was it okay to take this out? Because I was freaking out. Like, what if they don't catch, you know, that double arrows down at 140? And she similarly was like, it made her nervous at first. Um, but she told me, she was like, they may do things differently than we do at home, but they'll be okay. And that was kind of what Dr. Cortez had shared as well. That whole um, having to let go of, everybody at school, the, the care at school looking like what it does at home and that being unrealistic. And um, what it helped Dr. Cortez was you kind of framing it as like, we want to set you up, you're, we want to set up the team um, for success, right? And expecting too much of them is not going to do that. So it took, it, took a, it took a lot out of me to be like, okay, I'm going to let go of how much control um, we have at home and they have been fine. So there's that. 
does it make any of this or did it make does it make because it's still ongoing it's kind of weird to frame the tense of this question but did the initial planning as you started to accept certain realities of how things can be managed uh, any of that easier because you yourself are living with diabetes and um, does that I guess how does that impact your interpretation of of the plan that you were putting together for your kids um I never had to do deal with orders growing up. I don't know if it's because, um, partly because I wasn't necessarily in the United States when I was in, in school. Um, I lived abroad and so we never had to deal with, it was more like we had a school nurse at the school that I was at when I was in high school and middle school, I don't remember ever having a nurse. And it was just like, figure it out, take care of yourself. Um, and so having it myself, the bigger focus has not been on the particulars of what management will look like in school, because I honestly do trust that the teachers are not going to let my kid go low. I actually trust that like the, the system in place works for that. Um, the thing that I come in with as a person who has diabetes is thinking about the emotional and mental aspect of going to school with diabetes and making sure that's something that the team is aware of as well. Um, so for example, we had an instant last year where the orders were read very, very, um, to the like by the book and so what ended up happening is she went low I think like five or seven minutes before snack time and so she had a low treatment and per order is you don't retreat a low within 15 minutes and the way her nurse last year read that interpreted it was she can't eat and for another 15 minutes so she was told she couldn't eat with her friends um it, and so it turned into this whole thing where she was told, wait, you can't eat. And my kid still remembers that. She's still like, when I met with the, the aide last week, she, we took him to the playground to meet the aide and the nurse. Uh, and she was like, mommy, come play with me. And I was like, hold on, sweetheart. I'm going to make sure these grownups know how to take care of you when you're at school. And she on her own was like, so what happened in kindergarten doesn't happen again. And I was like, oh, wow, that stuck with her. Um, like she still remembers that incident. And so just that awareness of being, and, you know, Dr. Kudas, I think we changed the orders to reflect that she will never be stopped from eating with her peers, even if she's 200 and they're having cake, that's fine. Let her have cake. Um, but yeah, that, that thinking about their emotional well-being, being part of it is kind of, I think the thing that my having type one, um, helps with more so than any, anything else. Uh, so Dr. Cortez, as you go about, because I feel like, as I understand, again, because I didn't have any of these plans whenever I was, I was in college, I was diagnosed. So it's just sort of like, all right, here's how you bowl this for a, a hot dog or peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you're off to the races. Um, but a, as these plans sort of start with, with you, do you um, rely on sort of a, a template set of actions and then fine tune it to the patient's needs and, and the goals that you all agree on? Or do you sort of assess it um, starting with patient needs and then kind of, um, get to the paperwork from there. Like if you can, I guess more directly, um, what's your sort of workflow like as you're working with your patients, um, yeah, with these families great, to, to get to that question, sort of paperwork? Christopher, uh, you know, you really have to start with the template in mind for the standard person who doesn't necessarily even exist, but that's the starting point. And then, uh, you know, because first, first there's a few things to keep in mind. And then you have to think about the last thing that Syra talked about is we have a kid here uh, who has who has needs to be a kid, and we've got to work that in somehow on top of everything else. But our first thing is safety. Okay, safety is more important than blood sugars for the most part, and that's that's got to be built into orders on a sort of on a from the word go. Okay. Second thing is everyone needs to be flexible, and that was the hard part, as you as uh, Sarah pointed out. There has to be some flexibility because on the other end. We need uniformity to as much of a degree as we can, because anytime someone has any special personal thing that's different from everyone else, you've just increased the chance of a mistake tenfold from happening. And, and so on the other hand, you can't have everyone the same. Everyone has very, there are very different types of ways of administering insulin and more and more every day for the most part. And we're gonna have a lot of individualization that's gonna be needed, but we need some kind of framework that keeps as much as we can the same on everyone. And then there's issues like, okay, these are the rules, but okay, this kid more important than the rules is to eat lunch, to have recess um, after lunch. We've had kids like, for example, an issue could be what if 
no one's there to give the shot of insulin that particular day because everyone calls out sick or something who could have done it. Okay, you know, and then maybe we're waiting for mom perhaps to somehow leave work or whatever and drive to school, eventually get there. Does that, what often has happened is the kid might have been stuck at the, in, in the school nurse's office the whole time, you know, and now, you know, if mom gets there and, and lunch and recess are over, you know, why didn't we just let the kid eat, go to recess and mom would pick up the pieces later because the higher blood sugars that would have ensued is not as important in that moment as taking care of that kid in a, in a better way. Unfortunately, you can't write orders too easily about stuff like that. It's kind of common sense. And that's kind of where, you know, the school nurse really has a big impact on making life really happen nicely for kids. But the question, yeah, we start off with kind of the same and then we move, we move out. The school orders, uh, for me at least, are five type pages. So we're talking you know, like that's how long six single space, eight out. point font. Like, I mean, what, what kind of five um, page are we talking here? When we first invented this system, uh, we actually were able to get it on a checkoff list for the most part on one side of, shape of a paper with a four point font. And when that's at the point we realized we better go to two pages. Uh, but wow. since then, with everything that's technology that's come in, yeah, it's been more. But going to electronic medical record systems, you don't have that. Uh, it's kind of a different interaction with the, with the paperwork. And so to have it where it needs to be for the physician at all times, you need to use your electronic medical record systems, which changes it from checkoff box systems and things. And it added a lot of space overall. So it's like yeah. we're basically a 12 12 font now, but, uh, uh, you know, so, some areas I emphasize with 14, you know, and, and bold them a little bit and things, but there, that that's where, uh, you know, it, it's an incredible amount of words to do this right. But most of the words are the same for everybody, you know, and then I, you change what you need to. Yeah, I, I, I guess. So the, one of the comments you just made about how you have to sort of can't necessarily account for common sense, or you have to account for common sense within the framework. Does it, help to sort of like go through this process every year of like kind of rethinking how you talk about diabetes when you have to break things down in that sort of framework and that interpretation for somebody who doesn't live with the stuff day in and day out, like talking with the diabetes patient, they're living it, they're managing it. Obviously there's a different sort of language and syntax you can use with your patients, but when you have to explain the mechanisms of diabetes management, when you're thinking about that broad level plan, that five page thing, does it actually help as like a mental exercise for you to sort of think about the big picture and like the actual steps? Um, to diabetes management as you sort of break break that stuff down? Who's that question to, Christopher? As to everybody, but we'll start with Dr. Cortez. <laughs> I actually I actually don't mind chiming in Go on that. Yeah. I feel like I, I do that on a daily basis when I'm working with those health clerks at the school site. And those health clerks, they may call themselves the school nurse because that's the nurse's office. They have that, that title on their door. But um, again, they're, they're not RNs. So I'm the one that's going to them and explaining to them all of these. So I do have to take that language and, and kind of assess their knowledge of how much do you know about diabetes? How much do you know about this new technology that's coming out that you probably you know have never heard of before? So I at first have to really assess their level of knowledge and then tailor how I explain it to them afterwards. So in those cases, I, I feel I feel bad with Cyrus' story because I if there was maybe a school nurse like that had diabetes, like they would have been a little bit more mindful and been able to be like, okay, I understand that this isn't going to be, you know, as big of a deal. We want to make sure that she can get out to lunch and, and be with her friends. But a, a lot of nurses as well, they don't necessarily have that daily knowledge of how to live with diabetes and how to manage it. And so when they're at school, and they're training the people that know even less, like sometimes things get lost in translation. So I think it's really important if you you work with your, uh, your endocrinologist to make sure that those orders are very clear and that they're, you know, there's still a little bit of, like Dr. Corsa has said, there's a little flexibility. So just, I think there's a lot of education that falls on the parents end, unfortunately, that, that you're, you know, advocating for your child to the school nurse. And hopefully if they're a professional and they're, you know, knowledgeable about diabetes, that they're advocating for your child in the same ways you would at school. Mm -hmm. um, so another a nurse this year, uh, when I referenced that, was like, that doesn't make sense. And I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it, there's a lot of variety in the nurses too, so. 
Yeah. And I, you know what, even with myself having diabetes, like I'm very mindful of, of like Cyrus was saying the the social emotional aspect of diabetes. I, I never want my diabetic students in the health office eating their lunch. And in some places, the school nurse, that's, that's what they want. That's their practice. And so I, I tend not to do that because I just, I think it really, you know, can be detrimental to the, the child's welfare. Yeah. Um, so another follow-up for you, Stacey, I, especially because you've been living with diabetes for so long, you've, you've been around personally to see like the advent and the Im- improvement of diabetes technology over the years. We have CGMs now, like that's a thing for those who are able to access it um, and afford it. Um, h- how has that made your work, I guess, easier, if at all? I mean, because I, I hear, you know, you know, giving a student a shot for lunch, but like, it's not a shot, it's a bolus. I tap this thing on my pump for, for insulin now. And granted, I'm doing that for myself, but like with the, the advent of all this technology to potentially ease the burden of some of that logistical hands-on management, um, how does that actually apply in practice, you know, between you and the teachers that you're working with? You know what, I, I would say that's a great question because I feel like I deal with a lot of that too. A lot of more students are coming to schools with continuous glucose monitors. And so there's the benefit of, you know, not having to test your blood sugar if it's, you know, FDA approved that you can dose off of it at lunch times, at meal times, and, you know, you get the alerts if your blood sugar is going low, if the child's blood sugar is going low at the school site. So I I think there's a lot of benefit to it, but then you also have to consider too that the student may have alarms that are going off that are, uh, you know, interrupting, not necessarily interrupting the class, but that the child is, is aware of in the classroom with the teachers. And so I think there's a little bit of an emotional um, component to that with is the child comfortable being able to, you know, potentially have their their CGM visible to other students for them to hear the CGM while they're in the class. So I think that varies from from student to student. But I think in terms of the technology, and, and I can say this, at least in the Orange County community, um, we tend not to, even though there's the ability to share CGM data with, you know, whoever the family decides that they as school nurses, we're often told not to have that technology on our phones. So generally what I suggest to parents instead is you follow your your child's CGM readings on your phone. And if you see something concerning, I want you to just give me a call and we'll alert the the appropriate staff members at the school site. But um, it's generally in my practice, I haven't seen any school nurses that will actually download that app on their phone to have it. And it's, it's just a liability to if we were to have that data and be mm-hmm. somewhere at a school site where we can't get to your child in time, that, that's when it gets tricky. So that's the reason that, that most of the time school nurses are not encouraged to do that. But I always I always tell parents that I it's a great tool and I want you to use it. And if you know anything comes up, you can just let me know. But we're not going to implement anything until you know it says if the orders apply. So just because like, like I'm gonna use uh, Cyrus example earlier, double arrows down, you wanna, you wanna do that, do something, you wanna act on that. We have to follow whatever the orders say. So if the orders, generally we're not gonna be chasing trends throughout the day at school. So most likely we have to wait until, you know, oh, Dr. Cortez's orders say, you know, only treat the low blood sugar if it goes below 70, then we'll go ahead and, and actually implement some sort of action. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you brought up a great point that, and when you write orders, as from the physician side, we never wanna write an order that we know you can't carry out, or maybe on a certain day you can't carry out, you know, and, and so it, it always has to have that in mind, and, and this is one of them. Uh, so usually for the, the idea is if the alarm goes off and is, and is audible, that's the call for action in the school system. And we have to be able to not let that alarm then go off every two minutes uh, because then there's no education and this kid also gets traumatized by it. In fact, one of the big issues that uh, the kids have is the being called attention to when these alarms go off as well. So, but that would be typically one of the examples of not asking uh, you know, to, to do more than is possible for, for a school nurse to have the Dexcom on there phone is an incredible liability among anything else because they're not necessarily there to act on it you know and they would have it on their phone 24 7 on top of that (laughs) so so this this is not really the way to use that information 
But, uh, you know, so we're still learning better and better ways of using that information in schools. But having orders that say alarm is, is one very important way. And, and, and the parents setting those alarms to match the order. Mm -hmm. So speaking of alarms, Syra, potentially in your house, there could be four alarms going off, <laughs> um, which is a lot. Like on top of being a parent, you have to manage your own diabetes. You have to be aware of your husband's diabetes. You have to be mindful of your kid's diabetes. Um, I guess the big question I have is how do you manage the burnout potential just for you whenever there's everything else going on and then you've got your own Dexcom buzzing or you've got one of your kids' Dexcom alarms buzzing? Like um, what, how do you, how do you do it? I don't care about myself as much as I care about my children. This is my thing. Uh, we're all on automated dosing systems. So that has made it significantly easier for all of us so that our highs are not as high and our lows are not as low. But full disclosure, my blood sugars have been awful the last two days because this has been like the first time I'm sending both kids. I think I've ranged between 348 in the last 24 hours. But um, my husband's been fine. So <laughs> if that tells you anything about moms uh, versus dads. But um, yeah, it's, um, it, it can be a lot. I don't know if it's relevant to like, because we, we have a lot is not the norm. Um, I don't know if Dr. Cortez, you and Stacey have ever been around that many people with diabetes in one household, <laughs> um, definitely not the norm, but it's more of the, um, I'm hopeful that with them being at school, it'll actually feel a little bit easier as it, as it goes along. And I'm not rechecking Dexcom every couple of minutes um, just to make sure that they're okay and we'll get there. But um, going back to what you had said, Dr. Cortez about like, and both you and Stacey about like those alarms, that was something I struggled with, like turning the alarms off so that those, those falling trends were gone. So it's basically just, you know, alert at high, alert at low and alert at, um, all the falling and high, uh, trending up, whatever those, those are called. Having to get rid of those was something I struggled with initially, just like getting rid of that graph was something that took me a bit to get rid of. But then uh, even in this first week, as the aide has texted me and been like, she's 79. And I'm like, it's, it's okay. You don't have to do anything. Um, I'm grateful that we don't have all those alarms because um, having them feel like they needed to do something and me letting them know, trying to impart everything we do to somebody is really hard. And also remembering what I know that they don't is really hard. So that's, it's just, it's a process, right? Of how much is too much for someone who isn't a parent um, and how much is too little to, for someone who is with them for so long is just, there's like a, there's a balance. And I don't, I don't know if we're quite there yet, um, but I think it just, it will depend on like both the parent's personality. I, for me, the hardest part was just the not knowing how much this person knew what the system was gonna look like at school and everything, right? So like before school, that that was the hard part, just not knowing. Um, and so as we get in closer to, you know, a couple of like almost a weekend, um, that's what's making me feel a little bit better. The whole seeing what the system in place is, right? Seeing what the backups are, knowing, knowing these people and trusting, like, okay, these these people want my kid to have a good time at school too, right? Um, it's hard to trust other people you don't know with your kids. So, right. Yeah. Uh, so, sp uh, hmm, I don't have a good segue. I usually pride myself on that. But, Stacy, um, when I think about um, making adjustments to these plans, um, obviously, data is going to be a big part of that. Technology access is a separate sort of component of that. But um, for the parents out there that are watching this now or in the archive later, hi. Um, what sort of recommendations do you have for those parents when it comes to evaluating data? to potentially make changes to those plans. Obviously you go in on the first day of school with an expectation, but then the reality is gonna set in, the school routine is gonna set in, and there can be data to inform adjustments. Do you have any recommendations for parents out there to like how much data is sufficient, do you feel, to, um, to suggest changes, like going about that? What do you think about that? I think it's really important to look at the data and mirror that with what the routine is at school. So at what time is your student going to recess? At what time is your student going to PE? What time is the student eating lunch? 
I think all of these things really impact the, the student's blood sugar. And if you're following that data, you can probably very clearly see when is the student going to recess and out, you know, playing on the playground, getting a lot of physical activity. And, you know, potentially you, you see maybe some lows afterwards, or maybe they get really excited and you, they go high after recess, who knows. But I think it's really important to look at that data and understand that you know those rot those routines often change during during the week too. So I'm currently right now as I prepare for for the school year with the the different schools that I'm managing. I'm looking at my diabetic students and I'm recording at what times they're going to PE, and then I'm also looking at what day is the minimum day. So you mm -hmm. know on for us it's Thursday, so that means they're going to be eating either a little bit earlier or a little bit later throughout that day. And so it's really understanding the school schedule, and so. And that, of course, varies almost every week. So I think it's really important to be, be looking at those things. And I, oftentimes, I don't know if the parents are, are aware of that. You know, sometimes that, that knowledge, you only find out after the fact that, that your student went to the library today instead of having an extra, you know, PE session or, or whatever. So you never know. So I have a follow-up right there. I'm going to be very precise about how I ask this. But do you find that you often have to become, in a sense, a... Um, uh, a, a product trainer of sorts in terms of like, oh, by the way, here's how you can review this AGP report, for example. Um, here's how you can review this, you know, this daily view, this weekly view, this sort of, I mean, those sorts of things, depending on the platforms that might be used. Like, it, it, again, this is a type of webinar, but like thinking more broadly about um, empowering your, these families to engage with this stuff so that they can make informed decisions as well. Do you find Obviously, you have to be knowledgeable about what's out there, but do you find that you have to do a lot of supplemental instruction on what these what this technology is actually capable of? So I, I feel like because I'm diabetic, I have a lot of that knowledge and I like to share that with the families that I work with, but I wouldn't say that that's common for most school nurses. If okay. you're not using this technology and you're not aware of what's out on the market, then you probably don't know how to inform parents about how to utilize it to its, its best, you know, capability. So, so you're saying you're a unicorn. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I'm saying I'm a really good school nurse. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it, it really depends. So I, I think it's important for parents to um, make connections with their school nurse. And maybe if the parent wants to take it upon themselves to educate their school nurse about some of the technology, then, you know, that knowledge can be passed down. But um, I, it, it's hard sometimes. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what I've been hearing from our school staff is that for them, it was easier without the technology because it, with technology, there's more you can do. And so there's more expectations of what to do versus like, they keep referencing this little boy who was on MDI and finger pokes and how it was like very clear, like this is the time you check. If it's between this range and this range, this is what you do. And then you move on with the day. Whereas now we're saying, hey, be on alert a lot more, right? Um, and it feels like it's almost from a school perspective that uh, this could, could just be like the experience that I've had where everybody's been like, it was easier before. Um, and I, I get, I get it as someone who grew up on MDI and finger pokes, like I get what they mean about there being less you can do, but, um, I don't know, is that something that you feel like you've, you struggle with it, with any of the other staff that you work with, Stacey? I, I think that's a really common refrain. And unfortunately, I feel like the school nursing profession also retains a lot of nurses that have been around for quite a while and are not as caught up on on the latest and greatest technology. So I, I do hear that quite a bit with, you know, colleagues in the professional world. And I think it's unfortunate, but you also, you know, have to remember these people don't understand how much better that control can be with the use of the technology. So I think they they probably think, oh, it, it was so much easier back in the past when we were only, you know, testing, doing a finger poke once before lunch and, and just going about our day. But I think we having this background in diabetes know, well, yeah, it may have been easier for, for you, but the child may have been having a much harder time throughout the day if their blood sugar is just all over the place, you know? And they just they just didn't know because they didn't have that technology to track it. So I think I, I now go in and work with these families having a lot more um, empathy for that because I'm like, I, I think it's, it's really important that we, we utilize the technology so we can keep 
you know, blood sugar is a little bit more stable so that the student feels better for longer throughout the day. So I think it's unfortunate that that's kind of, that's kind of the refrain that we hear a lot of. Mm-hmm. Um, so Dr. Cortez, uh, being a pediatric endocrinologist, you've got a whole range of sort of age and experience of patients you can, um, treat and, and, and work with. Um, the thing that comes to my mind then is puberty, menstrual cycles, like patients that are dealing with this on top of school, um, that obviously is going to add a layer of complexity to the plans that you're writing to the preparation you are working with those parents to make for those kids. Um, how does the fact that these are growing humans, uh, factor into the work that you're doing to help establish these plans um, at the beginning okay, of the school year. Okay, answers a little bit of that question and also a little bit of the, pre- the previous uh, previous uh, conversation too. Sure, please. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I do spend a lot of time with the parents and kids trying to teach them how to use this data because it, it really has transformed diabetes. The, what I do today is nothing like I did 20 years ago. I can't even recognize it. That's how different it is. And it's so much better. And in the and if the and at schools, if we stop to think about how much better it is, we're now finding people who have been low for five minutes, whereas in the past they were low for an hour or more on average before we knew they were low. And and uh, we have almost eliminated seizures in the school system. I don't think we'll ever say completely, unfortunately. Um, but that's the what technology has done. We we do not have that many major events anymore at school that have to be dealt with. We are preventing them all. And the technology coupled with what the school nurses do is the key to to making that happen. And and that's been really an extraordinary change over the last 25 years, Uh, you know, and for those who've just got diabetes, you're not gonna know that that piece of it. Another piece that, that goes along with the puberty question and getting older, we have a concept called the rules of engagement. Okay, that means that a parent should not be allowed to text or yell at their child if their blood sugar is 69. It means they have to have some kind of agreement. And this would be the same thing in the school system between the parent and the school nurse, that you're not going to intervene for a period of time until certain a little bit more happens to make you believe that they're not intervening, that they're not doing anything about it. That, so to, to have kids have some degree of independence as they're growing, but this allows the parent to have this ability to, 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 you know, to, to, to cover their back here, you know, to, to be sure they're safe. But if they keep saying it too quickly, then that kid never really learns anything, you know, and, and it only causes conflicts uh, as well. So having really good rules of engagement with the parents and the kids, and then with the the parents and and the school nurse and the kids and the school nurse as well, this is really key to to really making things, uh, you know, work work very smoothly as we as we grow and go through puberty. Uh, uh, I'm not sure menstrual cycles play an incredibly big role. Uh, in, in it, making it with, worse with diabetes or not. Uh, they're just part of, they're part of every young lady's life that makes a big role in and of itself. Some people will have some significant uh, changes in blood sugar and some others do not. Uh, but I think, I, I'm, I'm not sure, and I guess uh, other people on the conference might correct me, uh, that it, it adds to the diabetes. It's another huge thing in a person's life. And that's also something always to remember with diabetes. It is not your entire life. There, everything else everybody else has is still happening to you, right? And we got this extra thing to deal with um, on top of that, you know? So, so that's where I would kind of put some of, those, some of those issues in there. Problem is with puberty and growth at that level comes this, in, this quasi-independence that many aren't related, ready for. And that's why we also have kind of have to have school plans, which not only take care of the kids that have an A1C of 6%, but also take care of the kids that have an A1C of 16% Mm -hmm. or anything in the middle, because we have this entire spectrum on any given day in the school system. And and so so we have to have everyone on board doing things for, for, for the people that really aren't doing them properly or for themselves and need this kind of assistance and not to have, too, like I said, too many individual things because those are the ones 
who are more likely to have the big events and the problems. And they're more likely not to be on the, uh, the sensors, um, which have transformed things as well as mm -hmm. pumps. But uh, the sensors in particular, uh, the, the, the safety that has uh, brought to us and is, has been enormous. There. So, so I think those are issues maybe that I hope uh, answered your question. If not, I'll, I'll get, take get another shot at it. <laughs> oh, no, for sure. For sure. Syra, I, I saw your head tilt a little bit. I feel like <laughs> um, as someone who has had both of those A1Cs, uh, my <laughs> worst was during high school, during puberty, during menstrual times. Um, so I guess I'll push back a little on the periods not making a difference and, um, the puberty, I think you're not arguing. That's definitely a huge thing, but that was definitely the time where settings and everything needed to change. I was also, this was ages ago, so it was pre-CGMs. So all the only reason I knew that things weren't great were the finger pokes and there being this like, why are you high? And it's like, I don't know. And I was a kid and I just wanted to be like everybody else. Um, so that's where the whole, all of those different pieces, the emotional well-being and technology and all these different things kind of coincide with um, diabetes management is definitely harder as a teenager with diabetes um, in high school when you just want to be normal. So uh, I don't know how either the endos or the nurses can really help with that aside from being empathetic and saying, this is hard. This is harder as at this particular time. Um, it, that's the only thing I can think of. I have not, I'm not ready for my children to go through that yet. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be even better by the time we are there. <laughs> uh, Stacy, when it comes to those rules of engagement, do you have any sort of um, starting point that you try to encourage when you're discussing uh, these actions with parents and their endocrinologists? Like how do you sort of start that conversation for the parents that do have access to the technology potentially on a more real-time basis? Yeah, I actually, I'm really glad that Dr. Cortez brought that up because I, I really like to have the students themselves in the discussions when I'm speaking with parents. I really want to get them engaged in their own care. You know, I, I hate to be having conversations with all the adults and, and the student with diabetes is left out. So I think it's really important to give the child agency and give them, you know, the ability to to really, you know, self-actualize their own care. So I think I, whenever I work with students, I always make sure that they're in the room with me, that they're having discussions with me. And if we're making decisions, like, you know, for example, just the other day I was speaking with a mother and her her son, and I was like, you know, we, we should maybe consider what happens at PE. Would you feel comfortable, you know, coming up and just showing the adult here in the health office what your CGM result is right before you go off to PE or would you rather show your coach or or the person in the locker room like the coach in the the PE teacher in the locker room so you know giving the child the ability to choose for themselves what makes them feel most comfortable because then they're going to be more you know more compliant so you want to just make sure that that they're on the same page so that you know everyone's expectations are kind of you know at the same place so uh, asking this uh, as a parent of pets not human children but do you find that parents that are new to this specific aspect of diabetes management, that conversation with how the school's going to interact with it, that they might be a little unsure of how much flexibility actually lies in some of those scenarios. Cause like you just said, that, those are three or four different people that the student, that, that child with diabetes could be checking in with. Um, as I'm thinking about sort of the mechanics of a plan for that check-in, I wouldn't be thinking about all those different sort of options. Do you find that um, parents are often surprised when they're first being, um, in the first part of that conversation of where there is flexibility within this, despite it starting with a rigid document that is provided by an endocrinologist? Absolutely. Because I, I think a lot of times parents don't even understand, like, you know, if the student's in middle school and they're switching classes every few hours, like where they're even going to be on campus, how far away the, the gym is from the rest of the school campus, or, you know, where the cafeteria is, that there's a long walk in between, like things like that are, are things that really only the people at the school site probably have some knowledge about. Um, so I think, I think it is something that hopefully your school nurse will be able to have a little bit of that insight to share with you. Um, but if you're a parent and maybe your school nurse is, is not as forthcoming with that information, maybe it's something you can bring up to them. Just ask them some questions. Who's going to be, you know, who's the teacher for my student for, you know, each class period or, or where is this, 
you know, location on the school campus? Is the cafeteria close to the health office? You know, should my student be, you know, able to skip the line for the cafeteria lunch, pick up their hot lunch, and then come to the health office to bolus just so that they don't have to wait in line and, and spend all that time getting insulin in the health office and then they miss lunch with the kids out at the lunch tables. So I think I think there are questions that that maybe only the, the school staff can help you with, but that's why we're there. So if you, you know, have the knowledge to ask those questions, great, but there, it's a lot of times parents might not even and know to do that. So mm -hmm. I think it's good to be in webinars like this to learn that. <laughs> about what age you feel like you start including children? In you know what, that's a great question. It really depends on the student's mm -hmm. age and developmental uh, abilities. So um, if the student is, you know, like a, in a general, you know, as, as soon as possible, I guess is, is the best, best answer for you. So it depends, but also as soon as I feel like the student is able to grasp it, because um, we want the, the students to be. You've so. like, what's the youngest you've started that conversation with? Oh, so I, I had just this last year, I had a, a first grader who was very on top of it. In fact, she could do her own calculations for lunchtime boluses. Yep. Wow. So I, it's, wow. it really varies. I wouldn't say that's typical, but it, it really varies. So, but if a student is presenting, you know, with that type of skill level, I mean, why not have them involved in that care? Or at least that's I mean my perspective. I mean, respect to them. I have a full-time job and a mortgage payment and I forget to bowl for lunch. So if the <laughs> child's going to be able to handle that, then yeah. they are setting themselves up for success. Uh, Dr. Cortez, when it comes to mapping out and accounting for that flexibility, sort of, is that something that you're actively discussing as you're working through the initial plan too? Or do you, um, how much trust do you put in the school nurses that you're handing these plans off to, to discuss some of that? Where, where do you factor in flexibility in the plans that you're sort of yeah, working out? Yeah, that's good. Well, there's two different parts of the system. One is doctor's orders. You know, like mm -hmm. I said, they're like, like sacrosanct in some way that they have to be followed to the letter. And then there's everything else. Like what this kid eats is not my orders. The, the parent and if nurse may be involved with that too, um, work that out, you know, and we have orders that support those decisions that, that other, you know, that are not medical decisions, you know, so that's important. Um, again, there's, there's, there's MDI plans, there's people that are on even simpler insulin plans, so we can't even get to that level. There are people on pumps, we have people looping, right, we have, there, there's different levels of, and then the combination of a either uh, of a, a, a hybrid closed loop system of, from a couple different companies are all and which both of which are different you know so we have all these different systems and so they you know it's not like we have exactly one plan fits all but you got to have a framework to work around that when Stacy talks to all of her local people taking care of that, that she she can pretty much use the same language and the same the same type of uh, the same type of orders and system that goes into every everything. But anyway, the, the flexibility is yes, yeah, got to be talked about all the time is one thing. But that 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 it has to be done though is something I think I should emphasize. Um, we found 25 years ago in Orange County this was not being done, and each a district we would have to deal with separately to do it. So um, a nurse who worked for this Orange County Board of Education named Mary Zombeck just took it upon herself to create a system to try to make this a bit, make this better. She also had type one, which was poor motivation. And she enlisted my help and the help of uh, a, a wonderful uh, diabetes organization called the Padre Foundation. And what was really behind it all though, was three laws that Congress passed that everyone really should know about. One is called the American with Disabilities Act passed in 1990, over 30 years ago, right? One is called the IDEA Act, um, which covers so much of school business. And the, and the most important one is called the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, almost 50 years ago, okay? And, and it's a particular part of, this is a very long document as Congress often does. And there's a particular part of this document, which is called Section 504B. And this is what gives the legal right for every child who has diabetes to be taken care of properly in school. 
you know, and if not, it is actually a, via, a federal violation of civil rights. And that's where we get the term 504 plan, okay, from, from this section of the document. And uh, you don't necessarily need a 504 plan. What you need is an agreement with the school that people sign and say, yeah, we're gonna do this, you know, and, and that's what we worked on with educating. And part of it was realizing how important the paperwork was. And part of it was realizing we trained and educated all of the district nurses in Orange County, literally in, in one by one or in groups and whatever. And it was so much buy-in. Everyone wanted to learn this stuff. And they in turn taught it to everyone else. The program is no longer in existence that we started, but it, it no longer needs to be either because each nurse continues this journey with, with their uh, with their staff and, and learns from other nurses as we go along, the concept of train the trainer there. And that is what transformed uh, diabetes care in Orange County. And I hope that is what's happening in most of the country now, but we were a bit of a pioneer and well ahead of the game uh, when all this started. And so I hope that wherever you're from, that these laws are known to you and there is this kind of uh, action going on. And if not, what it takes is an organization with interest and money, a nurse, a school nurse <laughs> to champion this and a doctor to work with. And you could make an amazing things happen in your district. Um, in, in our case, we did it for 28 or I forget, it was 26 or 28. I forget what we have in Orange County uh, districts. Uh, and so this is what is necessary. And I, he I heard, heard so many horror stories from around the country over the years. You know, and I just hope there is less and less. I, uh, I believe there are, but that is still, this is still a huge problem all over it, that what we're talking about today is not happening, mm -hmm. you know, in, I, in many places. I did not know the origin of the 504. I knew <laughs> about 504 plants, but thank you for that lesson. That's something that I've learned today. I hope all of you out there in video land. I appreciate that one as well. All right. So as we're closing out here, Stacy, final thoughts, any sort of words of encouragement for the parents out there, obviously, depending on the timing of their school year for their kids, thing plans are still being finalized. Plans have already been put into motion. Um, any sort of, you can do this, you want to offer to the parents out there that might be watching yes, this now yeah. or later? Well, actually, maybe a little bit of advice too. I, okay. I always encourage my diabetic families to consider, I know there are multiple different types of glucagon out on the market. But when you're deciding what's best for your student at school and what medication to bring, also consider how easy is it to train someone on? Because I find that sometimes the newer glucagons that are, you know, sometimes they're, the routes are a little bit different. So there's one that's a nasal glucagon that the staff usually has a very easy time understanding how to administer that that type of medication. And so that's the one that I always encourage our diabetic families to, to you know, ask their provider about, see if they can get a prescription for and bring that into school, just so in the event that we need to use it, and hopefully that won't happen, but that we're prepared, that everyone's trained and that it's easy to use. That's fantastic. Syra, we started this webinar with you. Let's end it with you. Any final thoughts, given all the caveats of Orange County, four people with diabetes in the household, all the different sort of caveats out there. Uh, any words of encouragement for the parents out there watching this now or in the future? No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like I'm speaking specific to my experience though. So I, I wanna be aware that I personally believe that we've had a very great team. I have literally Dr. Ortez is our endocrinologist and he's been, he's been doing this for longer and had the ability to tell me like, they don't have to do it the way you do it. I've had a great team. And, you know, despite what happened in the kindergarten that my kid still holds on to, um, <laughs> we've had a lot of accommodations that I realize I don't think most families will have. We've had, we had an, an aid assigned to our kids and I don't know if all schools have that resource. So with that caveat, um, I, I can say that with, with our experience that letting go of my own personal, like, this is how I do it. It took, it took a little bit of like, um, honestly, trusting Dr. Cortez and trusting the other moms I know to be like, okay, their kid was fine. And Dr. Cortez has worked with so many more families than ours. Um, it was, it was trusting that, right. That was, it was really hard, but, um, having faith in your team goes a long way. And just that, that knowing everybody has the same goal, they may not do it the same way you want them to, but everybody wants 
these kids to be happy in school. I don't think many people go into becoming endocrinologists or school nurses without wanting that same thing. Precisely. Good point. All right, let's uh, wrap this up real quick with a couple of reminders for those out there that are actually using Tidepool. If you have any questions, when in doubt, don't forget, you can always contact support at tidepool.org for any of those questions and somebody from our support team will gladly get back to you via email. Um, if you are interested in more resources, we have a couple of blog posts that we put up on tidepool.org slash blog. One that was published as of this recording like two hours ago um, are some additional tips from members of the Tidepool team. One who's a um, registered nurse had some thoughts and other parents of kids with diabetes who've also offered some tips and things that they've um, taken to heart and that have helped them manage that transition from summertime to school time uh, with their kids with diabetes. And as mentioned, we are a nonprofit organization. Donations are fantastic. If you are willing and able, tidepool.org slash donate is the place to go for that. And if you are feeling extra generous, you can always make that a recurring donation. See that green arrow on there? I'm just a wizard with this keynote application. Um, that has been it for our webinar here, Diabetes at School. Tidepool is connecting the community. Hopefully you've enjoyed us connecting the Orange County folks that are here. I didn't realize that would have rebooked all the guests that they're basically neighbors, but it's always fun to have these types of conversations with a variety of perspectives, experiences, um, and you know, unique insights into what it takes to make all this happen for one kid, a classroom of kids, a district of kids, a state of kids. Um, there's a lot out there. And it's, uh, for me, again, parent of pets, not human kids, um, I've, I'm always inspired by the work that's done, not just by the parents, but of the school nurses, of the endos, everybody out there that's working uh, with the interest of getting everybody happy and healthy so they can go on to do other things besides care about what the number says on their device one way or another. So uh, for me, Christopher Snyder, your community and clinic success manager. Thank you, Syra. Thank you, Dr. Cortez. Thank you, Stacy. Everybody out there, stay safe and we'll see you on the next one.